but we're all welded up. I've nitpicked all the welds. I'm happy with everything now. So now I've got to look at painting it. And I've got a lot of little areas that need a bit of cleaning up, a bit of smoothing out around the edges. The technical term is you feather your paint out before you put a primer on it. And so really all that means is that we just want sort of the paint ramped off a little bit rather than having a, a step of paint that we're going to fill beside. So we're going to clean all that up and we need the original paint roughed up enough that the paint will stick to it, the primer is going to stick to it and then our top coat will stick to that over the top of that. So we need to do a bit of sanding but before I do that I'm going to give it a good clean and I'll use a wax and grease remover for that. Before I started doing this work in the engine compartment I gave it a degrease, I hit it with the pressure cleaner and washed it all off and that's clean enough to be doing our welding repairs and things like that, but it's nowhere near clean enough to be applying paint over the top of. If we start sanding this area now and we've got remnants of grease, we've got air tool oil that spits out and things like that sitting on the surface, we've also got sweat from our bodies will be sitting on the surface there as well. If we start sanding all that in there, we can actually trap some of this material in the little scratches from the sanding and then when we go to paint over it we could have a delamination or a bit of a problem where the paint wants to react to the oils and greases underneath it. So it's a pretty important step to go around and give it a good wax and grease remover and clean it off and it's important you put a bit of time into it as well. I've taken the opportunity to get in there with a scraper and I've cleaned off any little bits of the original sealant material from the seams that was affected by the heat from welding. So I chipped away the areas where the joins had to go back together from the two pieces of different cars. But beside that, there was areas where the heat from the weld had gone around there. And it loosens this material up, it burns it a little bit, and we can't be sure of our new material sticking properly to it over the top. So I've actually chiseled it back a good area away from anywhere where I've welded it, and we'll reapply that before we get too far along with the paint process. So we'll get into it with a good wax and grease remover and there's a couple of different ideas floating around out there and traditionally we would use two rags. So you start with a wet rag which you've put your wax and grease remover on and you give it all a good rub to loosen up any ink, well, impurities, contaminants and things like that on the surface and then you come along with another rag and you dry the area. In more recent times, we've had decent pressure bottles on the market. And here's one from the people at Worth. And you can put your wax and grease remover in there and pump that up, and it'll give you a nice mist spray. A lot of people don't like this approach. Um, I'm in two minds. I tend to start with this to get rid of the big buildup of the grime, and then for the last time over, before I say I'm ready to put some paint material on the car, I will go the traditional way with a wet rag, wet with some wax and grease remover, wipe it over all my paint areas, and then I'll come back and wipe it off with a clean rag. But you will be surprised how much grime will come off with this stuff. So we'll get into it and give it a good clean, and then we'll start prepping it for the primer. It's important that we use a good quality wax and grease remover. It doesn't really matter what the brand is, but as long as it's sort of a trade quality product rather than something that's sort of just promoted around for general household work and things like that. So we want a, a real automotive product and uh, that'll do the job. So we'll get into it with a spray bottle and we'll start wiping it up and then we'll come back with our damp rag and clean it up after that. But it could take me three or four goes to get through all this grime. Like any solvent product, it's going to dry your skin out. Um, like anything to do with car paint, it's probably carcinogenic. I haven't actually read off the tin, there's a lot of fine print on there, but I would treat it as a nasty and try not to get it onto your skin as much as possible. If you do, wash it off, plenty of soapy water and um, dry out from that. If you notice you're having any problems with the fumes, make sure you're in a well ventilated area trying to do it in a little shed in the back ring and you start coughing and wheezing, well, naturally you need to get out there and get some fresh air into you. So. so, there's just grime coming off straight away without even rubbing it too hard. So. When you think about it, an engine compartment is always an area that's going to have oil and grease in it just things that spill out, mechanics doing service work, 
dirty hands leaning back and touching parts of the car and it might not appear to be that dirty but from a painter's perspective it's filthy. Now this is my work car, I'm not actually trying to give it a show quality paint job in the engine bay but I, I want it nice but not over the top so we bear that in mind the whole time we're doing our preparation work and our sanding. And with this era car, the engine bays are very busy. There's a lot of things in the engine compartment. So at the end of the day, we're not actually going to see a lot of the painted surface when it's all assembled up. I will point out, once again, this is a bit of a free plug. I'm not actually a promotion or a commercial. I'm not being paid to say this, but the Worth Company, they make a lot of products and distribute a lot of products that are handy for the refinish industry. Uh, they're pretty much all over the place. They're in all of the developed countries. They're a German company and easy enough to find. They pretty much deal with businesses. So if you're working from the backyard and you want something like this, talk to a local repairer. They will have access to Worth. You can Google Worth and you'll be able to find somewhere that they would be able to sell you the product through. But it's all pretty good stuff and it's a lot of things. They do a lot of little clips and things for this era car where you sort of want to hold the plastic panels back together. They do a lot of little screws and um, all sorts of things like any sort of fastener they've got those. And right through to additives for washer bottles and windscreen wiper blades and things like that. So pretty broad range they cover. Change your rags regularly. Once you reach the point where they're looking pretty grimy like that, you're going to be contaminating other areas that you haven't actually got to with the grime that's on the rag. So as soon as they start looking a bit grimy, chuck them away, grab a clean bit of rag and keep going with that. And you might go through a heap of rags, but at the end of the day, it's the finished job that we're after. And just thinking about some of my smash repair friends here, who would be a bit envious about the time I've given myself to do this repair when they're always locked in to do it faster, do it cheaper and things like that approach to the smash repair industry. little bit overkill for an engine bay but I've just been sanding this out and this is what I was talking about before about feathering the edges out. You can see here we've gone from the repair, there's an area of galvanise. Now you've got to be a bit careful when you come across galvanised panels in a car that you don't rip too much material off and remove it because that is a corrosion resistant layer there. So we'll be replacing that with a bit of an epoxy primer. But I've smoothed all of our grinder marks out of it and sort of spread it out. And I've just done that with the machine here because it was nice and flat and easy to get to. The rest of this area I've just been doing it with a bit of sandpaper and hand sanding it. And there's no real mystery about nice paint, it's just lots of grunt work. So what we need is anywhere where the paint has been burnt a little bit from the heat of the welding, anywhere where we've ground up to an edge, we need to just smooth those a bit. Because you can actually get little cracks in your primer that would let a bit of moisture through and you can get little rust lines through the paint. So that's pretty much good enough. I've only sanded these areas I'm going to put the primer on, but the primer naturally once it's sprayed will spread. So instead of sandpaper I'll come back with a scouring pad and I'll scour right the way around it and then we'll just sand the primer back and we'll sand this paint back to put the new paint over the top of it. And we shouldn't have too many problems there. It's a little bit down here, it's interesting. A lot of these cars, the manufacturers only use a base coat in the engine bay without a clear coat on them. And this is the case with this one. The sad thing for us is original equipment paint is not what we use in the refinish industry. It's a different product altogether. So to duplicate engine bays back to factory is a difficult thing. Um, a lot of people will use a base coat and a little bit of hardener in that. That works well. 
getting this sort of the right amount of satin finish on it is the tricky thing. I've decided I'm not that worried about the satin finish being accurate for this car. So I'm planning on just using a base coat, a satin clear over the top of it, and I'll probably put a little bit of a flattening base in that to dull that off a bit more than what it is because I'm just trying to leave it how it is. I'm not trying to sort of turn it into a show beast or anything like that, but I don't want it super shiny because I can't actually get to painting a lot of the engine bay and a lot of it doesn't matter because there's so much stuff goes in there you really can't see much of it so it's a repair rather than a total restoration but this will give me something close it won't be completely accurate but it'll work for us um, down here talking about just being a base coat a bit of brake fluid has leaked out at various times and I would say some of it has happened during normal servicing of the car because it was like it before I took it apart. Some of it has happened because a bit's weeped out now since I've had it pulled apart. Um, but it's taken the, the actual colour coat off and it's left the primer layer behind. So I've got to get in there and sand that and feather all that out so that I can reprime this area. And once we sand that, it'll come back to being a nice looking finish in there. Not that we can see much of it, but if we paint over these jagged edges and these lifting edges, we run the risk of having our paint peeling underneath at that at any point in the future. And more from a rust point of view rather than something that's going to make it look better or not, aesthetically speaking. So the big thing is preservation, corrosion control. But we'll shoot a bit of epoxy through here just over the areas that have been taken back to the looks like it is actual metal there rather than a, a primer layer or if it was a primer layer it was so thin i've just sanded through it um, and then we'll put our high build on top of that and then once that's cured we can sand it down and put our color over it i'm only using a bit of 180 paper here it's part of the Purple Queen 3M system and it comes on a roll and you just tear off how much you want at a time. I find if you are doing little sanding areas like this, two or three pieces folded up will give you a nice little pad that you can just get in and sand areas of engine bays and door jams and things without actually having a block and it'll come up quite nice just with the paper. So 180 because we're going to go to a high build primer and once the high build primer is sanded we'll sand that well dry with a 400 or 500 or something like that or wet with a 600 800 sort of paper probably wet sand it and my plan is to just prime the repair areas the bare metal areas and i've got a couple of spots up here where we had the front of the car cut off and I was working on trimming it to the right shape. I had it upside down on the concrete, so I'd actually scratched through a few spots up here. So I'll run a bit of high build primer just on those two high spots that got dragged on the concrete. And then once they sand it off, I'll um, paint over that. But all of this sort of stuff through here, I'm just gonna sand the old paint. Same with in here, sand the old paint. I'll just put the new paint straight over the top of that. And that will work. Now you can see the feathering out effect because there's the top coat, there's the original primer, and now we're going through the steel. So we've still got a bit of a jagged edge where we're coming down to the steel. So we want that to start disappearing around there. It looks like a bit of paper starting to reach its use by date. You know what, I think that's just about good enough for this old car. Got my green Scotch Bright. Now, green ones are the best ones for prepping for primer. So, if you're working like I am here with this old paint and things like that, 
the areas that we're going to really put the primer on and focus on covering those areas, we have sanded by hand with the 180. And the areas that the strut's going to spray to, I'm going to use the Scotch Bright for and just clean it up and make sure we've got a roughed up surface because it's the little scratches in the paint that the new paint actually sticks to. So we've got to rough it all up. If we sand it too fine at this point in time, we can have delamination. If we don't sand it enough, we could have delamination. So it's one of those things you really need to get rid of any shine. And it's a bit tricky where you've got an engine bay situation and there isn't a lot of shine, but on these areas, we can see the scratched up surface. Close up, please. So we've got all these scratches in here and that's what the new paint's going to actually bite into and bond onto. Some of you guys at home might not have seen this. This is plastic film that we use for masking up big areas. Now with two packs, because it's a slow drying product, any spray mist that sort of floats around wherever you're painting, whether it's in a booth or in your shed or out in the yard or whatever, whatever it lands on it's going to stick to and you're going to have to get it off again. So we use this masking film to mask off the big areas of the car. So there's a roll in here with 120 metres of this stuff on it and you chop the lid out the top of it and it just peels out like a masking machine. It'll just unroll as you pull it out. So I've got another box I just dropped on the floor at the back there, grabbed hold of the end of it, walked along the side of the car, draped it across the roof and it's covered up the middle section of the car but the best thing about this is it's folded and it's folded again. So if we grab it from the middle, you can pull it out and it'll go from the floor on one side of the car all the way across the roof and on the floor down to the other side. And even if you've got a big four wheel drive station wagon, it still reaches the floor. So there's plenty of material on there and it's a really easy, quick way to mask up. The stuff is as cheap as chips, it's just the best thing. But on top of that, this stuff here just loves it. You do that to it, it just sticks. Oh, it's just insane how well the tape sticks to it. So if you've got areas where you're doing like door jams and things like that, and you can't really get to the back of it because you're on the fourth door opening and you can't get your hand through the adjacent one there to seal it up, you can just sort of get it in there and dab the tape onto it and it pops on there and you can do it all one-sided. Good stuff. I love it. The writing on it marks the centre of the sheet. So if you line that up roughly in the middle of the car, that'll give you pretty much the same amount of material each side. Now because we're only going to put a bit of primer on, I don't have to get all that fussy about how I mask it. All of this painted area in here is going to get rubbed down anyway. So a little bit of overspray on that's not going to matter. I just mainly want to protect the areas I don't want painted, which will be like that insulator on the firewall, the brake master cylinder and booster, things like that, and naturally the rest of the car. So I'll just put a bit of tape in there to hold it. Now, I like fat tape. A lot of my old mates get a bit dark about fat tape because it costs more than skinny tape. And they'll get there and they'll mask it all up nicely with skinny tape. But I reckon the most expensive thing we sell is our time. Fat tape's very fast. I think it makes up for the difference.
not that I've got real carried away for now because it's only a bit of primers going on, but when you tape brake lines, if you're doing an engine bay paint job with stuff still in it, tape along the line and then it's easy to get the tape off. And then where you've got grommets through holes like this, it's usually easy to just poke them through the hole and they can sit out the way on the other side and you can even do a colour change in an engine bay and get away with things like that. And when you put it back together, the grommet's still all nice and clean. So there's a little pointer. I've still got to put the seam sealant on where I've repaired the car in here. Now, if we look at the way GMH did it, and it's also the way I prefer to do it, is to have the primer on there first. And even though we'll probably wind up wet rubbing this in here, the little bit of moisture that's going to get between these panels, we can dry that out well and truly before we put the seam sealer on it. But I prefer to get everything ready, primed, rubbed down, and then ready to paint, and then run my beta seam sealer as the last thing I do. Because when you look at it, it's quite lumpy and bumpy, and it's very hard to actually rub it down once it's cured and got your primer on it and you wind up with a lot of areas in there that just aren't rubbed that could delaminate. So I just prefer to do it that way and um, we'll try and get a factory looking finish on it. They, they never make much of a job, they're, they're never all that neat. But it turns out when you're trying to duplicate something like that, it's, it's a fair bit of work to try and get it to look similar. And to make matters worse, in this era, some of the stuff was sprayed on and some of it was actually put on with a wiping tool that sort of spreads it along a bit like that. So there's different textures and different finishes, but once again, it is only a work car, so as long as we've got goop in there that seals off our joints and stops the moisture getting in and causing rust, we'll all be happy. Just getting ready to um, mix up a bit of epoxy primer. It's just on the shaker at the moment, so we'll give it a minute or so to let it rattle around a bit and we'll give it a good stir. But I need a little bit. The epoxy primers are more to go over the bare metal areas and we don't actually have a lot of bare metal so I'll mix up the minimum amount I can in this mixing cup on the 4 to 1 setting and I'm hoping that'll be enough. So I'll give it two coats and I'm just going to use a normal top coat gun. It's pretty runny sort of stuff. It's no need to put a primer gun for doing epoxies because they're usually very sort of runny and um, so that'll seal off our bare metal. It's pretty hot today. Uh, the weather report, I just went and looked at it, it's 36 degrees for about now, and we're under a tin roof in this shed, so it gets pretty hot in here. And once I start the booth up, it's gonna draw the hot air from above the booth and below the roof through it. So it's gonna be cooking inside the booth, which is not a great thing because we have an optimum spraying temperature of 25 degrees, so we're 10 degrees plus above that already. So the paint's gonna dry pretty quickly. And you could say it's a good thing, it's not really a good thing. You can get a bit of solvent problem with that where the top layer of paint will dry and you'll have stuff underneath it which the solvents are still trying to get through and we can have some issues with that. But for what we're doing with primers, shouldn't really be any great problem. I'm not really worried about that but it's a matter of spacing my coats out. So I'll blow a coat on and I'll give that a bit of time to flash off and then I'll come back and like I say, the epoxy is just little spot repairs so I'll come and dust those in and then we'll give that a little while to dry and then we can put some high build on top of that. Now, if you're thinking about doing the same thing, not all epoxies can be recoated straight away. Some of them need to be baked and cured and then sanded before they can be recoated. This one will do it, and I think it's a step in technology. So this is a BASF one, so it's a high quality product, but their old one, you had to actually let it cure before you could do anything with it. Uh, and strangely enough, in their cheaper range of product, they have one that you could wet on wet it. So it's all evolving all the time. So this one here, we can wet on wet, so we can get away with that, which is good for us, because it sort of means we can just go from one step straight to the other, and then we're sort of ready to start looking at color once that's all cured and dried. This one's a four to one to one mixture, so which basically means 25% hardener and another 25% of the reducer. And I say it's it's not a real thick product, so a bit of a shake and a bit of a stir, it's good to go. And we shall mix it up. Mixing cups are the easiest ways. It takes the guesswork out of it. When I started with them, mixing cups didn't exist. And 
we had dipsticks. And you get various dipsticks with the various mixes in them for the particular product you're using at the time. And this one's an old Uracryl one that, which was where I started with two packs. It was the first two pack product I used, but they make great stirrers. Bit of Glad wrap underneath or cling film underneath the lid of your hardener stops from getting stuck on there. Hardness tend to, once they dry, tend to glue lids onto tins. And I trialled that a few years ago and it works a treat, so I've been doing it ever since. And you get two or three goes before you've got to throw the thing away and put a new bit on. It'll work for today. Now I could slow the curing down with a different reducer in it, but I don't have any, so we're just going to run with the regular one, and we'll get away with it for what we want to do. Today it's just going to be a matter of altering our application technique rather than altering the, what we're using in product. If we're doing a big area, then we would have to be a bit more fussy about what reducer and hardener we had, but for today, this will do. Now most two-pack products like a little bit of time to rest before you spray them on, so if you mix them up and then finish getting ready, which for my case today is, I've just got to go over and make sure the whole car's clean, and I've got to get into my painting suit. Get my breathing gear all ready and stuff like that. Then we'll be good to go. Got a couple of nice holes in the tops of these rails. I'm going to poke the spray gun in there and just swing it backwards and forwards and spray a bit of paint in there to get on as much of the inside of that repair as I can. And it doesn't really matter, I haven't really prepared the stuff around it because it'll definitely stick to all the bare metal areas and then we'll get a rust treatment into it later on before we put the car together anyway. So just a little bit of extra safety more than anything to get a bit of paint in there first. So I'll do that and then I'll probably have to dust it off again because spraying inside there it's probably going to lift a bit of dust up from inside the rail and move it around. But we'll make sure we're clean after that and then we can just colour in our bare, bare metal areas.
Sunday morning and I'm about to get going with seam sealing our engine compartment up and then we'll let that cure a bit and we're ready to hit it with a bit of paint. But before then, come for a walk with me, I'll show you something. So we're experiencing a rain-bearing depression and it's the remnants of what would have been a tropical cyclone way up north and it's made its way down the coast and it got here last night so it's been raining ever since. So we've got a cooler day today and uh, apart from being a little bit more comfortable than when it's very hot, it does mean we're going to have to heat the booth to be able to paint our engine bay but anyway, no big deal, we'll make it work. So I've got some seam sealer. This one's from the Terrason Company. These guys do original equipment type seam sealers and they're a pretty big brand name in the repair industry. So anywhere that sells collision repair, supplies, paint, things like that, they will have access to this if they don't have it on the shelf. The big drama we have is trying to duplicate the appearance of what the factory did. Some of this car was sprayed on, which we can't do with what we've got available to us. Um, and some of it's really quite wide beads. And I forgot to ask for a wider nozzle, but in the past I've got these Terrason nozzles and they've been, I don't know, about 20 mil wide, seven eighths of an inch sort of stuff in a wide flat nozzle. And they're good for doing these big wide seams with. But we can cut this one on a bit of an angle and get a wider nozzle than what you would normally get from it. And that's what we'll do. Now, if you've got visible seams that you want to get looking factory-ish, um, save them for last. Do your practice runs in spots where you can't see. So if you're not familiar with the product, that's the best advice I can give you with that. So we'll punch a hole in the end of it. Now, with these ones, they don't seem to last very long once they're open. So for guys that are just doing small restorations of home, you sort of need to get your seam sealing lined up and do it all in one go because if you come back to your cartridge a week later, there's a fair chance it's going to have cured in the tube and there won't be anything you can do with it. We shall chop him off. I'm thinking a big wide angle. Might be better if the Stanley trimmer blade was sharp. So if we cut him off something like that, we can use the whole width of the nozzle as we sort of run along the seam. So if the seam's between my fingers like that, we could get a nice, and we can angle it so that we tip it away from the edge. That'll let a bead build behind the nozzle as we move it along like that. We'll give that bit of a go and we'll see what we get, but it'll work all right. The other thing is you've got to look at what the factory did. Some places will have a deliberately narrowed out piece of sealant on it and this car had exactly that under the wheel wells so I've got to come back to that point and just have a little tiny bead along the seam but what we'll do put a pair of gloves on and I can wipe it with my finger as we go along if it's got too big a build and it's the sort of stuff that wants to stick to everything as you're using it your clothes and bits of the car and even if you look around a factory engine compartment or the inside edges the doors and things like that on this era car you will see spots where it's gooped and dropped and not been spread out so if you wind up with it looking a little bit messy sometimes that actually adds to the factory appearance as well so we'll get going underneath the wheel well and it's coming out there or some This bit through here is where it was a bit thinner than factory. And it was this sort of appearance up to about here, and then it went sort of really flat through here. So we'll wipe that down. I don't know why. I think it's more to do with the fact that's where the brake hose is. Looks pretty ugly, doesn't it? Well, as long as it stops the moisture from getting in the spots we don't want it, I don't really care. We can come back with a little bit of prep, so I want a rag and just clean the edges up a bit. Yeah, 
a bit like paint straight off the gun. Seam sealer will look the worst straight away and then it sort of shrinks in a bit. It'll look a bit better as it cures. Get rid of that bit there. That'll work. Now I've got a seam across here where I joined part of the replacement to the original. It's forward of the wheel. There's an inner guard that fits in here, but I just want to put a bit of seam sealer in there, just in case a bit of moisture creeps up there and it wants to rust where we've done our plug welds. Now, it's always the case that you can't really put too much on if you just want to keep moisture out of something. couple of spots here. The bottom of this one here is not one that GMH sealed, but it's one I've had apart, and it's in the front of the car, so moisture coming in around the bumper when it's been driven in the rain could drive in here. The same thing, if we just get some sealant up in there, the moisture can't get in and cause rust between the pieces. And that's all we're trying to do is to stop the moisture creeping into the seams and starting rust problems. Now there was a heap of sealant around this, but it was a sprayed on sort of stuff, so we'll just smooth it out and spread it around. I'm guessing there'll be plenty of room for the headlight to fit in there. Now you might find that you've got some areas after you put your paint on your car that where you've done plug welds, you might have a little bit of a half moon somewhere. And so it doesn't hurt to just run a bit of seam sealant down in areas where it's not visible over your plug weld areas, just in case there's a little pinhole in there that once again will start a bit of rust in the future. Just about to put some colour in the engine bay in our ute, but the first job is to put a bit of blending clear around. Now anywhere where you do a repair in a base coat, clear coat sort of system with a solvent two pack, you need to put a blending clear in it. And this is a sealer to seal off all of the repair areas because the base coat itself is just paint with a solvent reducer in it. So that just thins it out. But the primer that we put over the top of it is a two pack. It's actually got a hardener in it and it's cured solid. So where we do our repair and where we sand out to the edges and you get to the very edge of your repair, you'll get little scratch lines through the primer, just microscopic little ones, and all the way around the edge there. And when you put the new base coat over the top, the solvents in that will go in and melt the solvents and the base coat underneath that edge of that cured primer and so you get these little wrinkles where it fries up because it swells up that paint underneath that. So by putting this blending clear over the top of it, it seals all that area off and it's also a bit of an adhesion binder to actually help your paint stick to your old repairs and your old paint that we're painting over and then we put our new base coat over the top of that. So, And this is just a one to one straight out of the tin into the gun and off we go. And Now, I'm not 100% certain with the engine bay whether or not it's got a um, bit of hardener in that paint that's in the engine bay to give it a bit more durability. So I'm just going to give it a bit of a lick around the whole engine bay, all the areas I want to paint. And it's not going to affect it in any other way. Just make the paint stick on a little bit better. So let that drip through in there. And and the beauty of this is it's all designed to work with the system. So when we go to putting our base coat on, we've only got to tip, tip this out and we can put the base coat straight into the same gun without having to wash the gun in between. So that's kind of cool. Okay, let's go into the booth. 
Last thing I want to do before I start painting anything is just give it a bit of a wipe around with the tack rag just to make sure there's no big lumps of dirt and things in there that are going to affect my paint and that way it's all clean and ready to go but I've got it all rubbed I've been over with the scour or we've seam sealed it so we're, we're good to go. Look at that. So pretty. It's pretty important that we go to the right mixing ratio. With all these modern paints, everything's all worked out down to the last drop. So this is a two to one mix. And all it is, is just the paint and the reducer. So that goes in there, two to one, beautiful. So once we stir that up, we're good to go. So I'll go in and I'm just gonna color in the pieces where I've been working to start with and onto the gray piece. And then we'll finish up by putting a few coats over the original green. make it all back yummy again. All the work I do, it all comes down to just a little while of slopping a bit of paint over something. Okay. Put our lid back on the tin so the paint won't sit. one bit trickier. We'll put the strainer in there as well. Put that in there. That on there. That bit on there. And it's always important to strain your paint before you use it because um, sometimes there's lumps and bumps and bits and pieces in there we don't want. Still a little bit fresh. the greatest of conditions today so um, taking a little bit longer to cure it's not one of those paints that really takes a long time to set up but it's some of it's dry but this stuff up here is ready to paint over but where I finished up and painted across this bumper it's still a bit wet
I've just mixed up a little bit of chassis black and I'm using a direct metal industrial paint. It's a Valspar product, but it's really good for doing your chassis black areas underneath the cars, rails and things. And I'm just going to hold a piece of cardboard up to mask the green off, but I will put another coat of the green on before I do the clear anyway. So if any gets past and there's a little bit of overspray somewhere, the next coat will cover that. And this stuff's really good because they actually do say with the product that it is surface tolerant, which means that it will handle a little bit of dirt behind it. It will handle a little bit of grime and grease behind it even. So, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna get away with painting a dirty, dusty rail, but within reason, it'll stick to a dirty piece of metal, which is good.
worked by yourself for as long as I have, you've got to come up with these little systems to do jobs. That's a handbrake for a floor jack, and it works very, very well. That's him. So what is that, a mounting bolt? That's the engine mount, that's Pete's just there. Yeah. It's got studs that go through the cross member, and bolts up here on top of the bracket. So just to get it to drop in, I've undone the top of it to let it move a little bit more. I've spent most of my life working by myself on these things and I've put hundreds if not thousands of engines in and out by myself, but I've got to admit these days, the portable sky hook makes it a whole lot easier. Alright, we're out of here. It's done. It's in.